punt again. So uh, real tough time uh, for those uh, Zachary Broncos last night. Um, only 206 total yards in the whole game for Zachary. Zachary, um, you know, is a, is a quality team. They're 4-3 overall, 1-2 and two in district play. Uh, but they were no match for the Central Wildcats, who look really, really good. Uh, we've talked about the Wildcats before. We've talked about Meyer and Triplett before, and they're looking sharp. Uh, that runs Central's record up to 3-0 and in district play. Also, there was another big game last night in 5-5A action as uh, the Catholic High Bears uh, faced off with the Dutchtown Griffins. Excuse me. Uh, big... Big matchup in that district. Catholic coming off of a, a, a loss uh, in the district earlier. And uh, Dutchtown with a big win uh, last week. So uh, both teams really uh, putting it up for, you know, possibly the lead in district play. Um, both teams were 4-2 and two going into last night's game. Catholic 0-1 in district. Dutchtown 1-0 in district. Well, Catholic really owned the day last night as... Um, they, uh, Darius, I uh, hope I pronounced his name correctly, Guiche, I believe it is, 236 yards on 34 rushing attempts. Let me repeat that. That was not an error. 236 yards on 34 rushing attempts. He was all over the field last night. Uh, Catholic High quarterback Danny Cameron making his first uh, start of the year. Um... Threw one touchdown pass, uh, was a little tentative, as you might expect a high school quarterback to be in his first start. Uh, 5 of 12, 59 yards total. But uh, whatever recipe they cooked up, it worked because Catholic uh, got the big win over the Griffins. 38-22. Uh, to 22. And uh, we will have uh, Matt Moscona, who is the play-by-play -play broadcaster, for Catholic uh, with us in a few minutes to discuss that game last night. So a lot of action going on in high school football. Uh, we will uh, take a short recess and be back with uh, more football, more gridiron coverage. You are listening to Louisiana All-American Sports. This is Eric Hatfield. We'll be back in just a few minutes. promised we have uh, Matt Moscona a uh, play-by-play announcer for the Catholic Bears on with us uh, Matt how you doing this morning well you know uh, we got a uh, you know I, I think uh, you know it's, it's different we can we can we can Matt Moscona as many of you out there listening know has a very long and storied history in, in Baton Rouge sports talk radio and uh, he was kind enough uh, to uh, to grace this show. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, that's my, my bad. All right, you, uh, sorry about that. And you're out there in Radio Land, you're probably just now here. We got Matt Moscona on the line, uh, Catholic High play by play announcer. Can you still hear me okay, Matt? Matt okay, Matt? Matt? Okay, okay gotcha. All right, so um, we'll jump right on to it. Um, Matt, can you tell us a little bit about um, what you saw last night? Catholic really hammered uh, Dutchtown pretty hard, 38-22. Um, what, uh, I guess just give us the, the lowdown overall, what you saw. Recognize that there are just different level players, and he's one of them. There's a reason that he's a running back who's got an offer from LSU, and they're eyeballing him for 2015. There, you put a kid like that on a high school football field, and you know, even good teams have great athletes. There's probably, you know, maybe three guys on that team. You know, a guy like Darius, guys in the open field, to bring him down one on one. So when you see a kid like that, the ball 34 times, and you dare an opponent to tackle him 34 times, he's going to get his. He's going to get his, and he did last night. 236 yards, three touchdowns, 
and it was a it was a big bounce back that the Catholic needed coming off the loss at at Santa Mar, where they just I mean, they've just been so decimated by injuries. But having a guy like Geis back, it just there's a different level of confidence with the team, and clearly production as well. Two thirty six runs, two hundred and thirty six yards by Geis. Uh, how many games, Matt, had he had he missed? Well, he'd missed three of the last four. He um, he played in the opener against Parkview, uh, and that's when he suffered a thigh bruise. Mm-hmm. He, he played the following week against Mandeville in a game that he probably should have sat. But, you know, I mean, Mandeville, it, you know, they have a D1 quarterback with Couillette, and yeah, that was a game where they needed Darius to give him what he, what he could. And so he went and then sat out against um, – he sat out against Denham, tried to play against Rumble, and then, then he's missed three of the last four since then. And then he two in a row after Rumble. So it, um, it, it's kind of been a hit or miss season. And one thing's for sure, dude had fresh legs last night. <laughs> he sure did, and I think he probably wore down the uh, the legs of the of the Dutchtown defense. Now, you had a, a, a quarterback. One of the, You mentioned several injuries. I'm assuming one was to the quarterback position. As I understand, the young man who started last night, Danny Cameron, that was his first start. So t- uh, for Phyllisson out there, uh, who's the regular starter? How long is he out? How much is that going to impact the team? And what did you see in Cameron last night? Yeah, Nick Coombs is a uh, you know high school football fans in the Baton Rouge area know that name. He's a three-year starter as a senior, and last week in Santa Ma, took a helmet on the knee near the sideline. Mm. Uh, not too serious, thankfully, but as I said, he, he's out for sure for two weeks. So last night, and then he'll miss this week against McKinley, and they'll hope to have him back for the final two games against Woodlawn and uh, and EA. But uh, you know. Coombs is, is a gamer, man. He's, you know, he also pitches on the baseball team, and he's he's just one of those really great high school athletes. So he's committed to play baseball at LSU Eunice. Awesome. He's a dual threat guy who can run and throw. So you know, just the leadership there they certainly miss, and his ability to, to run the offense. But the kicker is that you know Danny Cameron. I, I, I'm sure a lot of people recognize his last name as Cam Cameron's son. Right. He was a quarterback at his high school in Maryland last year. But he came to a situation at Catholic where they had a three-year starter at quarterback. Mm-hmm. So Coach Weiner said, look, we, we just, he's such a good athlete, we got to find a way to get him on the field. So we've seen Danny play wide receiver, tight end, H-back, safety. He's even kicked off. Good grief. So, he's, I mean, he's a great athlete, and you, he's kind of been like the utility player if there's such a thing in football. Right. But uh, whenever, when Coombs got hurt last week, they put in Ian Bryant, who's a sophomore quarterback, well, Ian Bryan hurt his shoulder in the JV game, and he's out for about four or five weeks. Oh, boy. So Danny, by, by necessity this week, went back to quarterback and took solely reps at quarterback this week. And, you know, Eric, he's, you, you can tell he's a great athlete, man. I mean, he's the son of a coach. He, he plays the game fundamentally sound. So he's over six feet tall and you know, about 215, so he's good size. He can run it well. You know, his stats last night passing weren't, weren't spectacular. Right. But... You know, he threw a beautiful ball in the back of the end zone for a, a touchdown with 11 seconds to play in the first half. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he put another one, just kind of dropped it in the bucket in the corner of the end zone, and the kid dropped. And he's he's got talent. There's no doubt in that. He could start. He could start for a lot of places in high school. Right. Coaches make coaches look very smart. <laughs> he definitely seems like somebody who is capable of rising to the occasion. Um, that would make so Catholic ups its record to a uh, one and one, recovering off uh, in district to one and one, five and two overall, recovering off the Santa Ma. Uh, loss. We talked about Santa Mar earlier. There, uh, a force to be reckoned with. Uh, of course, Dutchtown was dropped to one and one. Realistically, what are Catholics' prospects in district and down the line? I mean, do you think Santa Mar? I mean, Santa Mar's won six straight. They looked just ridiculous against McKinley last night. What do you think uh, the 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 picture looks like in District Five Five A? What are Catholics' prospects? Do, are they looking at a wild card? What are we looking at potentially down the road? You've been covering these guys a long time. Well, if Assuming that, that Darius Geis is healthy, and you know, another thing we haven't talked about is, is Clyde Edward Lair, Catholic's you know, quote unquote other running back, who had 170 yards last week against Santa Ma in place of Darius Geis. He hurt his knee last week against Santa Ma, and he's out for, for three to five weeks. So they've they've just kind of been been decimated. But as they get healthier, I think the you, know, you, you hate to kind of put it this way, but with the new playoff rule, you know, with the select non select right. split, I mean everybody. In 5A select makes the play. So Catholic's already in, regardless of what happens. So, you know, obviously you go out and you want to win every game you play, but as long as if they're healthy by the end of the season, let's not forget, this was a team that was ranked in the top five in right. 5A state 
earlier this season. Where right. They, they really physically controlled the game against a very good Parkview team, and they beat Mandeville, which, as I mentioned, was a, a semifinalist a year ago, and they beat Denham 34 to nothing without various guys. I mean, this was as good a team in the state when they were whole, and I think if they could get whole by the end of the season, and you're talking about a team that, that is capable of beating anybody in the select classification in the postseason, you, know, you asked about district, well, and you'd have to think that, that they'd be favored at least to win against McKinley and Woodlawn. Oh, sure. Season. An EA in the in the you know in the finale that's over in EA and it would probably be a much different game if Sione Pelele was playing and you just hate to hear about that young man because right. he had a knee injury but right. um, you, you know I, I, it's look I mean as long as they're whole and they're healthy they're they're a great football team and I you know, I don't use that term lightly they they really are a team that can contend for a state championship and in, in select this year you don't think you're a little biased in that Matt are you <laughs> no I, Eric I mean it's you look at you look at a guy like Darius Geis, and it all comes back to that. Right. Geis is, is a. I mean, so many people talk about Leonard Fournette down in New Orleans, and St. Augustine. Mm-hmm. Last night, I mean, Dutchtown is as. I mean, they, they grow athletes on trees in Dutchtown. I mean, we're talking right. about the place that, that just keeps churning out D1 prospects. If it's Lacey or York or Eric Reed or sure. Collins. I mean, and, and Darius Geis ran right through them for 236 yards last night on 34 carries. They're just, at this level of football, when, you're, when your offensive line is churning, you have a guy like Geis running, you can beat anybody. That's a good, the recipe saying, oh, I'm choosing with, with Fournette. Right, um, absolutely. It, it would be fascinating to see, uh, you know, St. All a Catholic matchup somewhere down the line in the playoffs and see Geis and Fournette go back and forth. That would be a heck of a one-on-one. Would it be, could, I, could I boil it down saying no dice, no guys? I mean, no guys, no dice for the Bears? Um... It's certainly a huge part of it, and I, I, I would think realistically any shot of winning a state championship would, would go out the window without Darius Geis. Sure. But, but Clyde Edwards Elayer is a more than capable running back, and, and you know, when Nick Coombs comes back, clearly Danny Cameron as well is a, is a fantastic asset offensively. Uh, they, they could certainly make a run, but I would say to, to get to the, to the dome and win it, you, know, you, you have to have that player like Darius Guy. Absolutely. Well, look, I appreciate the breakdown. Before I let you go, uh, LSU Ole Miss today, what you, what you think? I said LSU 41-24. I think it looks a lot like the Mississippi State game where it just gets ugly in the second half. Um, you know, Ole Miss, just, they're not there with depth just yet. And right. All the injuries they, they suffered defensively, it, it's going to be so hard for them to overcome those losses. Matt Moscona, our guest, uh, host of... I don't want to. I don't want to bungle it. Is it uh, after further review? It's it's only been four years, Eric. One hundred four point five ESPN. You can hear Matt uh, weekdays at three o'clock. Matt, thanks so much for joining us today. You got it, buddy. Talk to you later. All right, take care. See you. So that was uh, Matt Moscona uh, joining us. A uh, lot of good insight. Excellent uh, radio host and. Uh, well, you heard that. Catholic uh, is a contender. You got a lot of teams out of 5 5 A that just look really, really good. It's like uh, uh, some kind of a factory. And I think we're going to have somebody penetrating very deep into the playoffs out of that district. So uh, we are going to take a very short recess. And uh, when we return, we will uh, break, get into some college football. Uh, we kind of uh, tipped off a little bit, uh, tipped our hand a little bit. We're going to talk about some LSU. Talk about. Uh, talk about LSU and talk about uh, Southern University as they go uh, to another bluff to face Arkansas Pine Bluff. Uh, We'll be back in just a moment. This is Louisiana All-American Sports. We are back on Louisiana All-American Sports. I'd like to thank all of you for joining us this morning. Uh, again, special thanks to Matt Moscona joining us, uh, going over the, uh, the lowdown on Catholic High. So let's jump into some college football. Uh, let's start off uh, 
on the bluff, or from the school on the bluff, Southern University, as the, they are facing our Arkansas Pine Bluff uh, this morning. Big, big game for the Jaguars. Uh, their defense has stepped up uh, tremendously. Uh, Dawson Odoms has just preached discipline, 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 and the defense is playing very good discipline football. Um, they were, they had the living daylights beaten out of them earlier in the year against the likes of uh, the Houston Cougars and uh, had a double overtime game against Prairie View A&M and had some scores that were comparable to college basketball scores. But, uh, you know, they, they coughed up about just under 2,000 yards in the first three games, 176 total points. Uh, they flipped that around, though. You know, one advantage of a so-called body bag game, when you get invited to a place like Houston, you're playing in a, an FBS uh, school and, and you have really no hope of winning, you definitely get tuned up and <laughs> tuned up in, in a couple of ways. You get tuned up by your opponent, but also you, you see what teams at a higher level, how they perform and how crisply they execute and what they do and things that go beyond 40-yard dash time in the, in the weight room. And I think that's really benefited the Jags. Um, last three games, like I said, uh, they've only coughed up 56 points. That's less than 20 points a game. Uh, and the SWAC, sometimes defense can be optional. So uh, less than 1,000 total yards um, run up against the defense. So uh, they're coming off that big 20-17 uh, to 17 overtime win against Alabama A&M. Uh, the quarterback, Dre Joseph, uh, you know, continues to be clutch. He, he continues to make plays when they count the most uh, in these SWAC games. It's, it's keeping Southern you know, right in the conversation, really, for a potential, a, a potential run in the SWAC. So, uh, you know, great job there uh, by the Jags. They've traditionally, not traditionally, but they've had some trouble going against Arkansas Pine Bluff in the past, so we will see how they fare um, this afternoon. But, uh, you know, I'm feeling really good about Southern. I feel really good about Dawson Odoms. I feel really good about Dre Joseph. I, I just have a feeling that this could be a real breakout year for Southern and coming off of the turmoil and the doldrums of the Stump Mitchell era, um, I think, uh, you know, we, we might see some impressive things out of the Jags. They might not be the only cats in Baton Rouge uh, making some noise in the college football scene. But speaking of the real cats, speaking of the Bengal Tigers of LSU, bum, 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 not here we go. They're playing Ole Miss today. Uh, we talked, we touched, uh, we led into that a little bit earlier uh, when we had Matt on the line. <clears throat> uh, they're going to Oxford. They're going to play Ole Miss. Uh, you know, LSU and Ole Miss, LSU has is, is owned the series over the last, I'd say over the last 20 years or so, but Ole Miss is tough, and they don't go away quietly, and, and they could be a really, really tough, tough out. So, um... <clears throat> You know, LSU showed some market signs of improvement last week. The defense, uh, you know, against the University of Georgia between the hedges and against Mississippi State, the defense had shown some cracks in the veneer, uh, some cracks in the armor. They really tightened up, though, only giving up two cheap field goals to Florida, only 240 yards last week in Death Valley. Now, granted, Florida is not... Uh, not a juggernaut. Tyler Murphy is certainly not uh, jo Johnny Football, but regardless, it's an SEC game. And uh, LSU was really able to control the ball game. Zach Mettenberger only threw for 152 yards last week, but, you know, when you're winning, uh, really, LSU controlled the whole game uh, pretty much from the first quarter on. When you're winning by multiple possessions, you don't have to do anything except for what you want to do. And LSU was at home, and the defense really, they played good ball. They made tackles. They finished their tackles. <clears throat> they flew to the ball. They, they did all the things that you expect uh, a defense coached by a defensive coordinator, John Chavis, to do. So uh, let's hope that carries over today. Uh, Ole Miss has a, you know, Hugh Freeze <clears throat> has got Ole Miss making some plays and scoring some points. Uh, quarterback Bo Wallace, uh, you know, almost 1,500 total yards passing this year, nine touchdowns, three interceptions. He has had Ole Miss in some games late against teams that maybe shouldn't have been. You know, the, the Alabama game, while obviously that was one-sided in the end, they, there were definitely um, there was some hope <clears throat> for the Rebels to hang on to. Uh, you know, in the end, Colonel Reb was crying, but there was something to hold on to at the, uh, until late in that game. Now, Ole Miss only has one SEC win, and that was that last-second squeaker over Vanderbilt in Week 1. But uh, Ole Miss is a program, I think LSU, like Matt said, I think LSU is going to win the game. I think they're going to win it going away in the second half. But I hope that they've prepared well and don't revert uh, and maybe look ahead to other games on the schedule. Because, uh, 
Ole Miss is a team that's capable of putting up some numbers. Now, the, the big difference maker there uh, in this game, uh, Ole Miss's leading rusher, Jeff Scott, is out. He is not expected to play. The times Picayune reported that uh, this morning. So, uh, you know, a guy like Jeff Scott, who's just a, 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 a gazelle, or, 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 or a plow horse, either way you want to look at it, depending on the role needed. He has 434 yards, averaging 8.2 yards per carry, a couple of touchdowns. Uh, when the guy like that is missing, you've pretty much removed an entire component of the threat that Ole Miss's offense poses, and that's going to put it all on Bo Wallace. I just don't think he's enough to, uh, to out-duel uh, John Chavis and... With the offense playing the way it is, I expect Zet Mettenberger to refer back to his video game like numbers, uh, putting up, you know, averaging 11 yards per attempt and putting up big yards, multiple touchdowns. I think LSU is going to win this game uh, going away, and it couldn't come at a better time for the Tigers. Looking ahead on the schedule, they have uh, an open week, then they have a, a body bag game at home against Furman, and then um, they got, uh, you know, they got, uh, they got the big boys at. Uh, Alabama and the showdown uh, with Nick Saban and that is going to be uh, epic as some of the Major League Baseballers say. So uh, we will see what's coming down the uh, the pike uh, for those Tigers as uh, they get ready to uh, battle. Um, moving on to some other college football action. Um, some of you may have heard the story that's been uh, unfolding in the last week involving another Louisiana uh, college football team, uh, another team that uh, has some cats uh, on the on the pro. Um, I'm sorry, cat is one of their mascots. They'll be the Grambling State Tigers from North Louisiana. Uh, Grambling is uh, the nadir of sports right now in Grambling, Louisiana. It is uh, at an absolute, uh, you know. I'm not even sure what to say about what's going on there uh, at Grambling. As some of you may have heard, uh, the students on the Grambling State football team, the football players, uh, protested. They refused to practice. Um, they uh, effectively walked off uh, earlier this week. There have been a lot of problems there. First of all, let's jump into the X's and O's very briefly, or jump into the box scores, rather. Grambling is 0-7 overall. They are 0-4 in SWAC play. Uh, that has got to be very, very difficult for, uh, well, really for any football team of proud athletes. Let's, not, let's, let's also extend this a little bit just to give us a, a, a greater uh, sense of, of the scope of what we're talking about here. Um, you have a basketball team that I want to say Grambling basketball it was one uh, either Owen uh, Owen a lot <laughs> uh, Owen twenty something or one and twenty something but really tough tough go for the basketball team there the football program winless this year I don't know if they got any wins at all last year maybe one it's been a tough time there uh, Doug Williams who was uh, a Grambling legend uh, former NFL quarterback Super Bowl twenty two MVP he was the head coach of the team he was fired earlier this year. Uh, the interim coach, I don't think the players like the cut of his jib. Um, among other things, in the protest, when they walked out, they demanded he was fired. He was. They got the coach canned. But the big kicker for Grambling uh, really is the treatment of the players, the treatment of the athletes. Um, you know, it's been one of those situations where no matter how bad a situation is with any football team, you expect certain basic needs to be met. And Grambling... Uh, you know, when you go a long way, when you go thousands of miles, when you travel, you, you, you expect at least uh, the year is 2013. We don't have horses and buggies. A, a coach bus might have been a, a, an amenity 50 or 60 years ago, but nowadays you expect to fly. Uh, opposing schools, smaller schools like Grambling, get hundreds of thousands of dollars to travel. They should have enough in the budget to, uh, to pay for airline tickets, right? So what does Grambling do? They take a bus. Yeah, they take a bus to Indianapolis. They've taken buses uh, a lot this year uh, and, and uh, to very far distances. I think Indianapolis might have been the straw that broke the camel's back uh, for a, a MEAC matchup. But uh, 
by all means, it's it's been really rough, and that was probably the last straw. So they walked out. They're going to forfeit today's game against Jackson State University. Um, they're going to pay a twenty thousand dollar fine. I, I can only help but wonder if uh, you know it might be a little cheaper to uh, put your kids on a plane and uh, pay the expense of a chartered flight rather than. Um, pay these five-figured fines and probably any penalties that they might end up owing uh, to Jackson State individually. Uh, it's a really rough situation, but you know, it, there is one, I guess, upshot of this, and um, that is that we've discussed some of the issues that college football players have had, some of the ways in which possibly there's some exploitation of bigger programs, their likenesses used for video games, jersey sales, Grambling is not one of those revenue-generating schools, but it does show that there is power in numbers. And when you have power in numbers, it can affect change. And I think that's what we saw uh, at Grambling. You know, they wanted the coach fired, he's fired. And I, I can only think that, uh, you know, there'll be some, uh, some Southwest, some JetBlue. Uh, there'll be some, uh, some different travel arrangements in the future. Otherwise, uh, it's going to be a really, really dark, dark time uh, at Grambling. Now, do I think it's going to make any difference whatsoever if, if Grambling is traveling? Is that going to improve the winless record on the field? No. Of course not. But it won't. But it will improve morale. And frankly, there's just a certain way you're supposed to treat student athletes when they come there on a scholarship. I think there are certain expectations. I think they expect uh, they expect first class treatment for their services that they're delivering. They're putting their bodies on the line, delivering a product, helping generate some revenue and some spirit for the university. And quite frankly, I think that that's not asking too much. So good for uh, the Grambling Tigers. Fight the power. Stick it to the man. Um, we'll see how that story develops in the coming week. Uh, but i got to say, the former Grambling State head coach, Doug Williams, uh, he did not uh, hold his tongue. He said, and I quote, I'm proud of them, boys. They took a stance. Good for them. So let's move on from the college uh, to the professional game. Uh, the New Orleans Saints, of course, uh, went to New England last week. Uh, I was expecting uh, big stuff, some big stuff from the Saints. They came back from 10 points down against the New England Patriots, and then came Tom Brady. Brady marched down the field with no timeouts, five seconds to go in the game inside Saints territory. Early this year, the Saints uh, stood down the Atlanta Falcons, Forced an interception on fourth down with a goal line stand. Tom Brady with no Rob Gronkowski, with no Aaron Hernandez, who's in the slammer. Uh, that would be the uh, tight end converted to wide receiver. Uh, with uh, an ailing Danny Amendola, could the Saints stop them? Would they stop them? What would happen? Tom Brady went Tom Brady. And on the final play of the game, the final uh, play from scrimmage, uh, found his man in the back of the end zone, putting the Saints away. That handed the Saints their first loss of the season. Tough break for the black and gold, but by all means, uh, you know, it's, here's the thing. It's very right. Only one team has gone 16-0 in the history of the NFL. Okay, that was the, uh, the Patriots of 2007. So the odds of going unbeaten is almost zero. But, and, and there's a big but, um... If you got to lose, and you're going to lose sometime, it might as well be an out-of-conference game, an out-of-division game. It will have no impact or virtually no impact on the tiebreakers should there be ties for home field advantage, should the Atlanta Falcons manage to rally and come back in the division. It won't affect that. So if you got to drop one, you might as well drop an AFC game. It is a heartbreaker. It would have been a big win, obviously, when you can stick it to Tom Terrific in his own building. Uh, it's a huge morale booster. But the Saints played well enough to win. Uh, you know, I didn't see any red flags in that game. Somebody, out of Breeze and Brady, they're both Hall of Fame quarterbacks. Someone had to go. And uh, Brady, you know, pulled it out in the 11th hour. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to the game against Buffalo back in the Superdome. The Saints will have played their first home game in almost a month since they uh, blasted Miami on Monday Night Football. And I think once they're home in the Dome, we'll see the Saints return to their winning ways against that AFC opponent. Uh, moving a little further down I-10... Uh, 
the Houston Texans are traveling to uh, Kansas City to play the Chiefs. A uh, couple of stories out of Houston. First of all, um, you know, being a lifelong Saints fan, um, I was very saddened to learn of the uh, passing of former New Orleans Saints head coach Bum Phillips, father of uh, Houston Texans defensive coordinator Wade Phillips, also former coach of the, Houston, the Love You Blue Houston Oilers, the ones that went to consecutive AFC championship games, uh, losing to the Steelers. Uh, Bum passed away uh, yesterday. He was 90 years old. Um, you know, one thing I'll say about Bum, Bum was one of those coaches uh, who was a straight shooter. His players loved him. His players loved him. And, um, you know, he... Uh, he was one of those guys where he gave hope to the Houston Oilers who didn't have much before. He came to New Orleans. He drafted uh, Heisman Trophy winner George Rogers, got Kenny the Snake Stabler over there. The Saints uh, played to an 8-8 eight eight record in 1983, which they'd only had one non-losing season in its history. He had a chance to go to the playoffs before um, a Week 16 loss to the Los Angeles Rams on a last-second field goal by Mike Lansford. Understand that if you're a Saints fan and you're you're – in your 30s or your 40s or older, you know you know that before Jim Moore, before Jim Haslett, before Sean Payton, all coaches that took the Saints to the playoffs, before Mike Ditka, who at least brought some expectations to the city, um, you know th th there was there was there was nothing. I mean, they had they had you had faith, hope, and bum, as some of the bumper stickers read, and bum did give some hope to the team and did raise expectations and when Tom Benson bought the team uh, you know he wanted to take the stepping stone that Bum brought there in New Orleans to the next level so um, you know I was uh, very sad to learn of the passing of Bum Phillips uh, rest in peace uh, and uh, thoughts and prayers go to uh, the Phillips family uh, but also with the Texans there's there's just you know it's, it's never I guess it's never smooth sailing in the NFL uh, Texans are making a have a little bit of changes. They're having some changes at quarterback. Um, you might remember this classic from last week. Take Matt Schaub and cut him. He ain't a welcome here no more. He threw another pick. Now there goes the season we were a hoping for. Well, as their season is going down in flames, uh, Matt Schaub was injured last week in a, a blowout loss against the St. Louis Rams at home. Uh, his popularity has uh, just gone right into the toilet. Um, he was, people actually cheered as he was helped off the field uh, with a leg injury last week. Um, you know, tough times, tough times in uh, the city of Houston. But they're making a change. They're, uh, they're going to go with uh, Case Keenum, rookie out of the University of Houston, hometown favorite. I believe he is the first University of Houston quarterback to start for any Houston uh, NFL franchise, that would be the Texans, uh, Oilers, or uh, otherwise. And um, we'll see what happens. Case Keenum put up video game-like numbers at the University of Houston, but, uh, you know, the NFL is not Conference USA, and Kansas City's defense is stingy and fierce. Arrowhead Stadium actually recently uh, broke, uh, set the Guinness World Record for the loudest crowd noise in a stadium. Uh, broke the record that was set just a few weeks ago by the Seattle Seahawks on Sunday Night Football. Arrowhead Stadium, when it is rocking, is loud. It's one of the toughest places in the NFL to play. And this rookie, with the hopes and dreams of, the, of this franchise, the crumbling hopes and dreams of, of the franchise on his shoulders, is going to get to meet the Kansas City Chiefs defense and Andy Reid. Uh, best of luck to you out there. We will see how that develops. I, I, um, I, I wish him the best, but I, think, uh, I don't think we've seen the last of Matt Schaub, at least not this season. But we'll see what happens. You never know. Uh, sometimes a lot of stars are born overnight in the NFL. Um, Tony Romo was an undrafted uh, rookie, and um, you know he, he started for the Cowboys on national television, and the rest is history. We have uh, Romo-liciousness to this very day. So we'll see how that develops. Moving along, we have uh, some bigger, more meaningful matchups uh, in the NFL so that could have some implications down the line. Uh, we have the Seattle Seahawks, who are 5-1, and one, and they are traveling to Arizona to play the Cardinals. Arizona, uh, I'm sorry, strike that. This was Thursday night. I, I stand corrected. They hammered the Arizona Cardinals, I meant to say, uh, in the desert. Big game on Thursday night football. Uh, it's one of those games that could have had some impact, could have had some, uh, some meaning, but the... Um,
the, the Seahawks, you know, they're, they're the real deal. They're going to be one of those teams in the NFC. I think we're looking at Seattle in the West, the Saints in the South, as possibly two teams that could be meeting in January for the right to play for the Super Bowl. It's, it's really coming down that way. You look at the NFC North, and the Packers look good. The Bears look good. The Lions look good. None of them uh, have that Tony the Tiger thing going. None of them are great, but they're good. I just I like what I'm seeing out there. The NFC East is an absolute train wreck. You have, you know, Dallas was leading the division with a losing record at one point. Uh, you have the New York Giants who are 0-6 and, and, and still mathematically very much alive if, if, if the pendulum swings there. So I don't think anything's coming out of the East this year. I think these Seahawks, these birds are the real deal. Um, you know, and we talked earlier about the impact of of losses. Their only loss came to Indianapolis. That's also an AFC opponent. So right now, uh, the Saints and Seahawks are going to meet later this year in Seattle. That is going to be a showdown <clears throat> in November. Mark your calendars. It would not surprise me if um, I believe that's a prime time game. I don't remember if that is a Monday game or a Sunday game. If it is a Sunday afternoon game, I'd be stunned if NBC did not flex schedule that <clears throat> for the Sunday night game. But that's a big showdown way down the line. So as we move on <clears throat> from the uh, Seahawks and Cardinals, also a big matchup um, that we have. Actually, that's probably the only we're going to move down the line to this weekend as we have um, the New England Patriots um, strike that. We're going to have the uh, well, it's my notes there. We have a big matchup. You might have heard that uh, there's some guy coming to Indianapolis who used to play there, Denver Broncos, going to Indy to play the Colts. Uh, Denver 6-0, and Indianapolis 4-2. and It's going to be a little charged in Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. Peyton Manning returning to the place he called home for the first time uh, since uh, he was released at the end of the 2011 season. Um, you know, you hear the Sunday night football theme. People have been, uh, the, you know, waiting all day for Sunday night. I think fans have been waiting all week for Sunday night. I think the Broncos were looking ahead to this showdown next week, which is why the Jacksonville Jaguars actually looked like a team with a pulse when they played the Broncos um, last week. It's going to be the real deal. The Colts defense is looking improved over last year in some regards. Uh, Robert Mathis is having another Pro Bowl caliber, all-pro all caliber season. He has nine and a half sacks. He's forced two fumbles. Uh, the Colts' defense is very stingy against the run. Um, the pass rush isn't, while they're getting pass rushes from, from Mathis, and that certainly stifled some drives and kept the Colts in games, teams have still been managed to put up yards. The Colts have the next to last uh, strike that. The Colts have, sorry about that. Colts are very tough against the pass. They have the next-to-last running defense in the NFL, though, and that plays right into the hands of the Broncos, as no Sean Moreno uh, could be poised for a very, very uh, big week. Um, the pass rush from Robert Mathis, he and, and Peyton Manning are familiar with each other, and uh, I don't think Peyton Manning wants to become any more familiar with him this weekend, and by that I mean uh, making Peyton Manning join the East Eat Grass Club via a sack. But if the Broncos are stifled, if the pass rush is forcing Peyton to make throws he doesn't want to make, if he can't find Demarius Thomas, if he can't find uh, Eric Decker, they can give it to Noshawn, and the Colts' defensive line has been blown off the ball on the run this year. The, the tackles have been completely blown up. I think it is poised, absolutely poised, for a, a big game for Mr. Moreno. Um, at the same token, the Broncos also have some more good news that they have uh, Vaughn Miller coming back. He, of course, had a suspension under the league's drug policy. He will be back. Last year, he had 18 and a half sacks, six forced fumbles. Uh, Vaughn Miller is the real deal. And Champ Bailey returned to the lineup last week. The Broncos have been torched very badly in their secondary. And uh, he is going to be a very welcome return. Uh, also, I just got a buzz uh, from, from Perry. Perry uh, doing his civic duty, working the elections today, working the polls. He did text me. That is a Monday night game that the Saints will have against the Seattle Seahawks later this year. So it will be a showdown before the very nation, before the nation, lock it in and rip the knob off. Uh, but back to Denver and Indy. I think Denver is going to uh, win this game. I think Peyton Manning is going to have a smile that just sticks with him in his sleep and on the plane ride all the way back home. 
Also in NFL action, we have the Cincinnati Bengals, who are 4-2, traveling to Detroit to play the Lions, who are 4-2. I think this might be the first meaningful game between the Bengals and Lions this century. Um, this game actually has playoff implications for once between these two. It's something that a few years ago you, you, you wouldn't, your ears would not be accustomed to hearing that. Um, the law firm of Ben Jarvis Green Ellis and Giovanni Bernard, running backs for Cincinnati, they've been a tough one-two punch, a real, real workmanlike workhorse, plow pulling, ground and pound, three yards in a cloud of dust kind of attack. But they've been effective. They've been effective in short yarded situations, and um, I think the Lions are going to have some trouble stopping this this one-two punch today. Uh, Detroit can certainly light it up. There's no getting around that. But Cincinnati's defense is a step up on some of the defenses that quarterback Matt Stafford has had some success. Detroit quarterback Matt Stafford has had some success against this year. Uh, you know, they 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 lit up the Minnesota Vikings. They lit up the Washington Redskins, uh, the Chicago Bears. Quality team, but they're uh, quality defense, but they're not quite uh, the level of what Cincinnati can offer. Cincinnati's just stout from top to bottom. You have Geno At Geno Atkins of the Bengals, uh, just pushing and throwing other linemen around like rag dolls when he's not being double or triple teamed. I think the Lions are going to have, have a tough time doing what they normally do. Now, Reggie Bush, um, you know, they, he can run the ball. And uh, he's really the, probably their only running attack that they have. They don't have much of a running game outside of Bush. They are a one-man show in the backfield. But Reggie Bush is averaging almost five yards a carry this year. Uh, he actually had uh, 78 rushing yards on 17 carries against the Cleveland Browns. While that doesn't sound like much, Cleveland has been very stingy on defense. Uh, only Adrian Peterson of the Vikings had a higher single-game rushing total. So Reggie Bush could be an X factor for the Lions. But uh, right now, I just think the Bengals have it together. But that's why they play the games. And we will certainly see what's going on with that. I'd like to remind you to uh, stay tuned. We have uh, Noel Jackson. Oh, sorry, we have Noel Jackson. Music satisfaction. Coming up uh, at the top of the hour at 12 o'clock. This is 96.9 WHYRLP Baton Rouge Community Radio. Uh, you are listening to, and Mr. Jackson will be in the building very shortly. So um, let's uh, not forget about America's pastime. Let's move on to the gridiron. Uh, we have the Boston Red Sox, who are playing uh, host to the Detroit Tigers tonight. Uh, big, big game in the American League. Uh, Detroit and Boston have gone back and forth, forth and back. Uh, it's been an incredible series as far as pitching is concerned, and you're going to get a real treat tonight as uh, Max Scherzer takes the hill against Clay Buchholz. Uh, Detroit has to win this game. They're down three games to two. Uh, Anibal Sanchez was uh, dirty. <laughs> he was a dirty Sanchez last week. He got lit up uh, pretty badly by the Red Sox. Uh, ball was slapped all over the park, and uh, really the uh, they gave up four runs very quickly, very early. The Tigers did rally back, uh, a very coordinated effort. But uh, when Miguel Cabrera hit into the double play uh, during the rally, during the late-inning rally, I think that really killed any chance Detroit had of tying the score. So as we go back to Fenway, we go back to Boston, must-win game. Uh, Clay Buchholz, you know, he was injured during the regular season, but he came back. He had excellent regular season numbers, but he is... You know, the regular season, you play all kinds of teams. You play the likes of cellar dwellers. You play the likes of, uh, even though they're an uh, a National League team, the Miami Marlins. You play the likes of the Houston Astros. I'm not saying that Clay Buchholz was smoke and mirrors. He was 12-1 and with a 1.74 ERA. But uh, Max Scherzer has been money. 21-3. and All he does is win, 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 no matter what. And I expect that tonight. Clay Buchholz in the postseason. Uh, the man with the bad perm has a 6.17 ERA this postseason. Uh, I really like Detroit uh, in that game six. And uh, if necessary, that will take us to a game seven, uh, which will also be at Fenway. And when that happens, you know, I, I think game sevens on the road are very, very tough to win. And I just do not foresee as talented as the Detroit, Lig Detroit Tigers are as much punch as they have in their lineup, and as, as great as Justin Verlander is, former Cy Young Award winner, 217 strikeouts in the regular season, he's going to go head-to-head -head with John Lackey, and John Lackey has been money 
in the postseason. And Detroit at Fenway Game 7, I just think the moment is going to be huge. And I think the Red Sox will probably be the team that will be traveling to St. Louis. Or strike that, I'm sorry, St. Louis. Will, they'll be the team hosting St. Louis on Wednesday night for Game 1 of the World Series. The St. Louis Cardinals absolutely obliterated the Los Angeles Dodgers last night, 9-0. Uh, it was a fantastic uh, season for the LA Dodgers. A lot of great stories, storylines there. Yasiel Puig, uh, clearly a shoe-in for Rookie of the Year. Clayton Kershaw, Cy Young Award winner. Fortunately for him, it's, it is a regular season award and not a postseason award because, uh, well, he uh, went up in smoke last night, as did the Dodgers' season, but nothing to be ashamed of. I think we're going to see a lot more of Don Mattingly and those guys as the year wears on. So we are out of time. This week, uh, we will have Coach Perry Daniels back in the building next week. I hope all of you out there uh, in Baton Rouge and streaming on whyr.org uh, didn't have too much of me. We're able to take 60 solid minutes of Eric Hatfield this week. But uh, we are going to be back in the building, the one-two punch, Batman and Robin, however you want to call it, next week. Uh, for Louisiana All-American Sports, be sure to tune in to LouisianaAllAmericanSports.com for the game of the week as we will have Parkview Baptist at Port Allen. For Perry Daniels, this is Eric Hatfield. We will see you next week. Good afternoon. Hey, hey, how goes it? Get you rolling. Fantastic, man. Let me get out your way and 